We all experience moments that shake us. A sudden loss, a frightening accident, a betrayal that ruptures our sense of safety. In the immediate aftermath, the body responds exactly as it should. Heart racing, thoughts fragmenting, sleep becoming elusive. These reactions are, in many cases, temporary. The nervous system recalibrates. The emotional intensity fades. Life gradually resumes its familiar rhythm. But for some people, the aftermath doesn't fade. The moment passes, but the brain does not. What begins as a normal stress response transforms into something more persistent. The memory refuses to settle. The body remains vigilant long after the danger has gone. This is trauma. Not merely the event itself, but the enduring imprint it leaves on the architecture of the brain. The brain is not a static organ. It is dynamic, constantly adapting to experience through neuroplasticity. This adaptability allows us to learn, grow, and recover from injury. But when the brain is exposed to overwhelming threat, this same plasticity can work against us. The systems designed to protect us in moments of acute danger can become overactive, reshaping neural pathways in ways that persist long after safety has been restored. When the brain detects danger, the amygdala activates rapidly. This almond-shaped structure functions as the brain's alarm system, triggering the fight-or-flight response. Within milliseconds, it signals the hypothalamus, which activates the sympathetic nervous system and releases stress hormones, primarily cortisol and adrenaline. These chemicals flood the body, sharpening focus, increasing heart rate, and preparing muscles for rapid action. In a typical stress response, once the threat passes, the parasympathetic nervous system brings the body back to baseline. Cortisol levels normalize. The amygdala quiets. The prefrontal cortex, the brain center for rational thought and emotional regulation, reasserts control. But trauma disrupts this natural resolution. When an experience is sufficiently overwhelming, the brain struggles to complete this regulatory cycle. The amygdala remains hyperactive, continuing to signal danger even when none exists. Cortisol levels may stay elevated for months or years. The prefrontal cortex becomes less effective. Neuroimaging studies consistently show reduced activity in the prefrontal cortex among individuals with post-traumatic stress disorder. This creates chronic hypervigilance. The person becomes exquisitely attuned to potential threats, scanning environments for danger even in objectively safe contexts. A loud noise, a sudden movement, a particular smell associated with the original trauma, any of these can trigger the amygdala as though the danger were occurring in real time. This is not conscious. The traumatized brain has learned, at a neural level, that the world is unsafe. The hippocampus, critical for memory formation and contextualization, is also profoundly affected. It helps us distinguish between past and present, allowing us to recognize that a memory is not a current threat. But chronic cortisol exposure can damage the hippocampus, Studies have documented measurable reductions in hippocampal volume in trauma survivors. When the hippocampus is compromised, traumatic memories lose their temporal context. They intrude into the present with a vividness that makes them feel immediate and inescapable. This explains flashbacks. A flashback is not simply remembering something unpleasant. It is a sensory and emotional re-experiencing of the event, often triggered by stimuli. The conscious mind does not register. The person may feel the same terror, the same physical sensations, the same helplessness. Because the hippocampus is not functioning optimally, the brain cannot place this memory in the past. The effects extend beyond fear and memory. The insula, a brain region involved in perceiving internal bodily states, tends to show altered activity in trauma survivors. This can lead to dissociation, feeling emotionally numb, detached from one's body, or observing life from a distance. This detachment can be protective, but it creates a barrier to emotional intimacy and self-awareness. The brain's reward system is also affected. Trauma is associated with changes in the ventral striatum and regions involved in experiencing pleasure and motivation. Many survivors describe anhedonia, a diminished capacity to feel joy or interest in activities they once found meaningful. 
When the brain is chronically oriented toward threat detection, it allocates fewer resources to seeking pleasure or connection. Over time, these changes reshape personality and behavior. Survivors may develop rigid avoidance patterns, steering clear of people, places, or activities that might trigger traumatic memories. They may struggle with emotional regulation, experiencing intense anger, sadness, or shame with minimal provocation. The hypervigilant brain interprets ambiguous social cues as threatening, leading to mistrust and withdrawal. Sleep is often severely disrupted. The hyperactive amygdala does not quiet at night, making deep, restorative sleep difficult to achieve. Nightmares are common. Chronic sleep deprivation further impairs prefrontal cortex function, creating a cycle in which the brain becomes less capable of regulating stress. Children are particularly vulnerable. The developing brain is more plastic than the adult brain, meaning early trauma can alter the trajectory of brain development itself. Children exposed to chronic adversity may develop differently organized stress response systems. The developing prefrontal cortex, hippocampus, and amygdala may all be affected, leading to difficulties with attention, emotional regulation, and impulse control that persist into adulthood. The Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, involving over 17,000 participants, found strong correlations between early trauma and health and behavioral problems later in life. Not everyone exposed to trauma develops these long-term changes. Factors such as social support, prior mental health, safe relationships, and genetic variations in stress hormone receptors all influence outcomes. Some individuals experience terrible events and recover fully. Others are deeply affected by experiences that might seem relatively minor. The subjective experience of overwhelm matters more than the objective severity of the event. Treatment has evolved as our understanding of the brain has deepened. Eye movement. Desensitization and reprocessing uses bilateral stimulation to help the brain reprocess traumatic memories, potentially allowing the hippocampus to properly contextualize them. Trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy helps individuals identify and challenge distorted beliefs about safety and self-worth. Somatic therapies focus on bodily sensations and the nervous system's state of arousal, recognizing that trauma is stored in the body's habitual patterns. Techniques that promote parasympathetic activation, slow breathing, mindfulness, certain forms of yoga, may help retrain the nervous system to tolerate calm. Medications, particularly selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, can reduce symptom severity though they do not address underlying neural patterns directly. These interventions can be effective, but they are not quick fixes. The brain reshaped by trauma does not return to its previous state overnight. Recovery often involves setbacks. Some individuals improve significantly. Others carry the imprint throughout their lives, learning to manage symptoms rather than eliminate them. There is also a broader social dimension. Entire communities can be traumatized by collective events. War, natural disaster, systemic oppression, displacement. Research into intergenerational trauma suggests that severe collective trauma may be transmitted from parents to children, possibly through epigenetic mechanisms that alter gene expression. The children and grandchildren of Holocaust survivors show distinct patterns of stress hormone regulation, even when not directly exposed to the trauma. This raises difficult questions. If trauma reshapes the brain, and those changes can propagate across generations, then addressing trauma requires social structures that prevent trauma where possible, and support recovery where it is not. It requires recognition that what happens to us changes us, often in ways we cannot fully control. Yet the story of trauma and the brain is not one of irreversible damage. The brain that can be reshaped by trauma can also be reshaped by safety connection, and time. Neuroplasticity allows for healing. New neural pathways can form. The prefrontal cortex can regain its regulatory capacity. The amygdala can learn to quiet. This process is neither guaranteed nor simple, but it is possible. What trauma does to the brain is significant, but it is not the entirety of who a person is. Recovery, when it occurs, 
tends to happen in the presence of others who can tolerate the pain without turning away. Understanding the neurobiology of trauma clarifies why connection matters so deeply, why safety is not merely psychological, but biological, why healing is often a shared endeavor. 